right. Welcome. It's a great pleasure to be sitting here today with Chupton Jimpa um, in this Helio hosted conversation. Uh, Chupton Jimpa is a mentor and friend who's the principal translator interpreter for the Dalai Lama for over 20 years now. Is that 30, 30 years. years. <laughs> You're getting old, Jimpa. <laughs> um, and also chairman of. Um, of the newly formed Compassion Institute and author of Fearless Heart, a wonderful book that really um, expresses um, not just the why but the how of compassion. So I'm looking forward to our conversation today to um, unpack a little bit more um, in, today, in today's context where there's so much um, uncertainty in this country and globally. Um, people are wondering what we can do to foster um, greater compassion. And I wonder if you would start by setting the context for us of why compassion now and is this, how do we uh, think about it in these challenging times when there's so much vital um, functions that need to be filled on the table? Why, why is compassion a priority? Well, first of all, thank you for inviting me <coughs> to this conversation. And yeah, thank you for giving me this opportunity as well. Um, and, you know, I, I'm aware that um, today more than ever, uh, people are feeling quite anxious and uncertain, and particularly in this country here in the United States. And, um, and one thing that people often forget is that the United States being the only existing superpower which has played such a key role in establishing international norms for over so many decades. Um, whatever happens in this country really has huge repercussions mm -hmm. across the world. And although we cannot attribute mental states to a country, but if we can, the state of mind of the United States really affects the state of mind and mood across the world. So, and right now, uh, U.S. is going through a very, very complicated time where you know, the people's political opinions are so polarized and there is a kind of, unfortunately, a level of, you know, kind of rhetoric that has reached a, a, a point which is um, quite confrontational, you know, from both sides, from the left side and from the right side as well. Um, so in this climate, you know, unfortunately what happens is then the fear and differentiation of your standpoint and your identity versus the opposite tends to become the much more dominant you know, perspective from which you relate and interpret whatever's happening. So in this kind of situation, I think it, compassion is really central because one of the things that taking compassion seriously demands is the willingness to look at the humanity of the other side. Mm. So even in the midst of the worst and most serious confrontation and dis, you know, differences and disagreement, if the two sides, of, you know, two parties in that discussion or dispute are able to at least not forget the, the understanding that the other side too is a human being, then there's a real chance for reconciliation. So one of the most important things that coming from, you know, taken from the wisdom of compassion in this particular climate is to see whether the, the tone mm. of the conversation that is happening right now could be cooled down a little bit so that at least people will not react to any news and situation from the position of anger and opposition and hostility and fear so that they are able to tap into a kind of a calmer state of mind and this is one area where I think compassion, taking compassion seriously, and also, um, you know, we we need to encourage the people who are able to, you know, adopt a kind of more neutral standpoint to be able to bridge the two extreme sides. And this is not happening at the moment, unfortunately. So compassion definitely has a very very important role to play. I want to read to you one of the questions that was posted on Facebook from Lisa Emmerich, who is a, um, a principal in a school. So one of the questions she asks is, a challenge I'm experiencing is how to balance activism 
and participation in activist campaigns when much of the activist rhetoric is not rhetoric that one would use in compassionate practices? Well, thank you for that question. I would like to thank the person who asked that question. It's a, this is a very, very important question because sometimes when people hear um, the advocacy of compassion, uh, and, and partly because compassion is a value that has been historically so identified with religious morality and religious teachings, um, and which generally tend to ask quite a lot, you know, to turn the other cheek. You know, those things are, and from the Buddhist point of view, you know, viewing your enemy as your spiritual teacher, those are, you know, for some individual that may be possible, but to expect that from an ordinary person is a tall order. So sometimes when people hear the advocacy of compassion in this kind of societal context, people tend to think that what is being asked is to just give in, bow your head, bow down your head, and accept what is the reality. That, you know, in other words, just simple giving in and pacifism. That, I don't think, is not what, what compassion is asking, you know. It's, for example, if you look at the great compassionate leaders like Nelson Mandela, or the Mahatma Gandhi, or even the Dalai Lama, these are deeply, deeply compassionate individuals and leaders, but also these are individuals whose sense of outrage at the historical injustice that their people are facing, or their, you know, the human beings are facing, is so strong, which motivates them to really rise up and oppose to whatever the existing structure is. So being compassionate and having a compassionate motivation doesn't mean you have to be completely passive and just give in. You know, in fact, a sense of outrage can be a powerful vehicle to express your compassionate concern. Mm -hmm. So I think people who are, you know, opposing an unjust system, you know, if they take compassion seriously, you know, they should understand that sometimes what compassion demands is a very strong active stand, you know, stand. I mean, there is a famous saying by this uh, Irish, um, you know, uh, statesman, Edmund Burke, who said, all that tyranny needs is for the people of white, you, you know, good conscience to, to remain quiet. And that's a powerful mm -hmm. message. So there might be times when, you know, if you are truly compassionate, you need to really express it in, in a strong opposition to an unjust system. So, you know, the rhetoric may not seem like kind and compassionate and gentle, but because the motivation is ultimately compassionate, because you want to change the world and change the society and change an unjust system to a more just system, that is truly compassionate action. It's, it's making me think to hear you speak that, you know, the, your context of having grown up as a refugee and lived your life in outside of your home country, um, what, what advice can you offer for creating your day-to-day -day life that is both manageable but not disconnected from, um, from the bigger uh, picture that you want to stay connected with advocating for? Well, I mean, my own experience as a stateless refugee, when I first began, I was not even one year old when my parents left Tibet, you know, in the wake of Chinese occupation. So, um, you know, my early memories of refugee childhood, um, in some ways, it's, it's a strange thing to say, actually, you know, I have very fond memories, uh, because, you know, my parents' generation, they really took the brunt of all that hardship, and being a kid, you know, our ignorance, my ignorance was a shield from feeling any trauma of that refugee experience. So, um, but on the other hand, one thing that I did oh, learn um, as, a, as a, you know, sort of a, a, a stateless Tibetan growing up in India is that, um, you know, one of the interesting things about the displaced people is that very early you learn not to tr believe too much in stability and predictability. Mm. And people, and, and as human beings, everybody craves for security and stability and predictability. And this is part of 
not just humans, but even as a, as a living species, a living sentient being, you have that built into your body because we walk on the earth and we expect the earth to be still standing there when we put the next foot down. You know, I mean, this, we're so used to, and this is one of the reasons why earthquake is so scary mm -hmm. because what we normally and intuitively trust, which is the ground, shakes up, you know, it then it has tendency to, I mean, it has this effect of completely destabilizing us. So expecting security and stability and predictability is something that is very natural. But at the same time, you know, one of the wisest things that people can learn is to not to over-expect and not to over-rely on predictability and stability so that the more you are able to learn to cope with some degree of unpredictability, uncertainty in your life, the more skill that you have that makes you resilient. And that's one thing most refugee people, people who have gone through the displacement, you know, in their life would have picked up. Mm -hmm. So uh, for someone like myself, uh, a change and uncertainty, of course, like any human being, is not very desirable, but it doesn't come as a shock. Mm -hmm. and, and this is one thing that, um, you know, people, particularly living in today's world, uh, has to really take seriously, because one of the reasons why there was so much anger in the last American election was there was a powerful collective expression of frustration that was being built up in a quite a large sector of the American population that has been experiencing uncertainty, unpredictability, particularly economic nature, for a long time and it was being built up. And that is partly, you know, people like to blame outsourcing of jobs and, you know, those kind of things. Up to a point they may have contributed, but to a large extent the change in the labor you know, world and all of this was a consequence of digitization and mechanization of many of the production lines. You know, I mean, mm -hmm. you have more rob robots in the car you know, production lines and so on. So this was the trend that the world was moving in, which has really had a long-term effect on changing people's expectations. So what we see, what we saw in the last election, particularly the level of anger and frustration, to a large extent had to do with certain expectations that were not met. Mm -hmm. That, you know, that expected a certain kind of security, stability and predictability. And to an extent we are able to psychologically adjust to a new reality where we cannot really expect that kind of old-fashioned predictability of job, you, jump, you join a job at the age of whatever, you, when you finish your school and you expect to retire in the same company. Those kind of things don't exist anymore. Mm -hmm. So younger generation, you know, are more able to adapt. But older generation people of my age, you know, I'm in my late fifties, find it very difficult to adapt to this. But on the other hand, the less you are able to adapt to changing reality, the more problem you create for yourself. So I think it's... Um, this is an important point that people have to keep in mind. Well, it's interesting that making that shift from relying on the external situation for us to feel comfortable and safe to being able to tolerate ambiguity. And, exactly, yeah. And yeah. what are some of the practices, I know you talk about this in your book, um, that you've seen be the most helpful for people in their day-to-day -day lives making the transition to work with the unknown and take that in as a teacher or at least accept it. <laughs> yes. I mean, it's a, it is a very, very difficult thing to do because, you know, as I said before, as a biological creature who rely heavily on the kind of, you know, s sturdiness of the earth, you know, we there's a built-in kind of need for us to feel secure. Um, but one thing that I would you know, kind of suggest is to, as much as possible, um, you know, of course the external means, you know, good job, facilities, all of these are so crucial, you know, no amount of internal resources is going to be able to re replace, you know, if you don't have food to eat, if you don't have a shelter over your head, you know, if you are living in a war zone, mm -hmm. you know, no amount of 
you know, internal mental kind of skills is going to be able to, you know, fulfill that role that is. But beyond that, I think, you know, having some appreciation of the mental resources that each of us as individuals have really makes a huge difference. Uh, you know, most of us, people who are living in the West, of course, the economic conditions vary from individual family to another family, but most of us in the West, uh, except, of course, there are quite a lot of, un, you know, homeless who are really destitute, but most of us are above the level of poverty. But so compared to a third world country, many people living in North America are pretty, you know, um, I mean, economically, you know, fairly secure. So I think in these kind of situation, you know, the more you are able to recognize that my happiness does not entirely depend on the external condition. To some, to a large extent, my happiness is also a function of my own state of mind. And being able to change that mindset, and also being able to tap into the richness that exists in your own, you know, intimate relationship with your family, with your spouse, with your friends, which are, you know, increasingly the research is showing one of the key to a happy life is a healthy relationship that you have. And those kind of things, you know, most people don't really think about it. You know, people think about when you ask people, you know, what would it take for you to be happy? Most probably, probably list a lot of money and as, 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 as they, on, on the list. I mean, the first item on the list, you know, a good job, a lot of money, you know, I mean, but the reality is up to a point there's a correlation between money and happiness, because if you can't support yourself, if you can't support your family, you're in a big problem, you're mm -hmm. in a big mess. But after a certain point, there's hardly any correlation between how much you have and how much happiness you have. Then the other side, other things kick in, you know, how rich is your relationship, you know, how much you are able to tap into your own inner resources, how resilient is your mind, you know, when you're confronted with adversity. So in these kind of things, I think the more people are able to appreciate that there are a lot of resources that are within our own mind, and the more they will be able to create a, a life where they see greater meaning and happiness. So one of the things that often comes up when we talk about compassion is people are curious about the relationship between compassion and empathy um, and getting uh, tripped up about concern with being overwhelmed by another person's suffering. Sure. Can you speak to? Sure. Well, that, thank you for that question. And this is in this distinction between empathy and compassion is one of the very important insights that are coming out from new science um, that are being done on compassion. Um, up until recently, you know, people were using terms like empathy and compassion and sympathy, kind of quite loosely. And, and for many people, empathy and compassion, there isn't much of a difference. But what we are finding out, and to an extent it's thanks to the kind of the scientific community, you know, engaging in conversations with philosophy, particularly from the Buddhist perspective, and looking at the eff effects of, you know, contemplative practice-based approaches, you know, we have a way of teasing out the differences. So to cut a long story short, um, now uh, neuroscientific research is beginning to show actually even at the brain level we can see a difference between whether the individual is in an empathetic zone or whether the individual is in a compassionate state. And this is a work primarily coming out of uh, Panya Singer's lab in Germany and uh, Max Planck Institute and which really um, you know fits very well with the uh, insights coming from the Buddhist psychology. And the distinction here is that empathy is more of an emotional state when you feel empathetic to someone, and empathy is generally triggered by a side of suffering, a pain in front of you. So you can feel the other person's pain, which is feeling with. So if the person is feeling sad, you feel sad. So this is feeling with. But empathy need not necessarily mirror this other person's experience. You can feel feeling for. So you can feel, you know, feel for the person who's feeling sad. So that's also an emotional state. But the difference between empathy and compassion is that when you 
move on to compassion, then you are no longer just in the state of experience of feeling, but there is also a motivational element that comes in, the want to do something about it. So there is also a wish. You, your wish is to see the elevation of that situation, the change in that situation. So the idea here is that compassion is a more empowered state. Because when you are in empathy, your focus is really on the problem, the suffering, the pain. Mm -hmm. But when you are able to move to compassion, not only are you focused on the so problem and the suffering, but now you're also focused on the solution, what can be done. And it's a more empowered state. And so I think this being able to distinguish between empathy and compassion, and, and I would argue that actually you do need to feel experience empathy to get to compassion. Mm -hmm. Because you have to be moved by the situation. If you don't care, mm -hmm. you know, you're not going to feel compassion. But if you, and being ca caring about a situation, means that you are moved by that situation in front of you. If someone is in pain, you are moved by that because you are a human being. And that feeling of being moved by that pain leads you to look for a solution, what can be done. And that's a compassion. So being able to distinguish between the two, I think has very important implications because people are talking about, you know, in healthcare professions, particularly, you know, talking about burnout mm -hmm. and stuff. Well, that makes a lot of sense, and and how does that play out for how professional caregivers are trained, so that they have the capacity to meet with and can have their patients feel connected with and heard? But I certainly don't want my doctor crying with me if exactly. I have a health exactly. problem. So having that, especially for these repeated interactions when people are doing this work professionally. Yes, yes, I think it really has a huge implications because often what happens is that people who at the front line of acute care, you know, like, a, you know, intensive care unit or, you know, uh, kind of, uh, uh, you know, where you're constantly confronted with a side of extreme pain. Often what happens is that the, either the healthcare provider, particularly the nurses and doctors, they either burn out because they just can't take it anymore. Mm -hmm. Or they develop a kind of a wall. They switch off. And it's understandable because you have to protect yourself. Mm -hmm. But neither approach is uh, ultimately constructive. Because if you switch off, then you hide behind this professionalism and acting cool, mm -hmm. and you become almost clinical. That is not really helpful either. And it turns out now there's a research showing the more, and this is a suppressive mechanism. The more you suppress expression of emotion, because you, you can't help feel it. Mm -hmm. You're a human being, you're not a robot. Right. But you're choosing to suppress it, and this suppressive suppression approach in the long term is actually very bad for your own health. So that's not good for you as an individual. But on the other hand, if you are, as you pointed out, you know, if you can't handle it, <laughs> you're crying. That's even worse because <laughs> then the you know the patient is going to worry you know am I in the right person's hand this guy is an emotional wreck you know so there seems to be at least a promise in this idea of compassion training mm -hmm. you know you and I have been you know been part of the Stanford compassion training the compassion cultivation training CCT and you know one of the things that we try to do is to really help people understand not just intellectually but experientially the distinction between being in an empathetic zone and being in a compassionate state. So there seems to be a real promise here that we could, if we could develop a program, a kind of a module which helps the healthcare professionals, mm -hmm. you know, to be able to have, develop the skills so that they can compassionately engage without getting stuck in this empathy and emotional emotional resonance zone. So this is something that is actually quite, you know, exciting. That there might be something we can do to help. Absolutely. I had a medical procedure at the Stanford Hospital a few years ago and the doctor that happened to be with me had just taken Kelly McGonigal's class and I was such a lucky recipient of, <laughs> I was so pleased because she, she was talking as we spent our time together about how it had made her 
rethink she had been a physician for 30 years um, but exactly that pra that practice of self-reflecting about how much of herself she was bringing to patients and, and what was by habit and what could be by design it was Oh, wonderful. That's very it's a nice yeah, it's nice. Very nice. And in the long run, the, the, the healthcare professionals, providers themselves gain from this. Because I don't think we humans are designed to be constantly in an empathetic zone. Right. No, because empathy is an emotional state. And emotions are, there's a reason why evolution has designed emotions to be a fleeting state. Mm -hmm. They you know, when emotion arises, it's supposed to indicate to us something important is happening around you or in your life. Mm -hmm. Pay attention. Mm -hmm. But we're not meant to be stuck in that state for a long time, you know. We're then supposed to pay attention, recognize whatever the important thing is, and then respond to that situation. So I think there is a reason why, you know, emotions are generally a fleeting state, mm -hmm. a state of mind. And if we're able to maintain a healthy relationship with something like an empathy, which is a powerful emotion, which is what I would argue empathy is one of the most powerful expressions of who we are as a human being. You know, there's a debate on whether, you know, chim chimps and other, you know, animal kind of, you know, uh, apes have the ability to have empathy. It turns out they have some rudimentary forms of it. So, but I would argue that empathy is a part, one of the most beautiful thing, things that, you know, makes us who we are as humans and you know, moral beings. Um, and the, it's this amazing ability to put ourselves into someone else's shoes. I don't think not many species have it. It's a, it's a very, it's almost a kind of a, a magical skill. So playing around with this from the context, maybe moving out of healthcare and frontline providers to those of us whose day-to-day -day work um, might be more along the lines of technology or a lot of time at computers or um, being inundated and working with in, in the context of information um, and, and the struggle that we might experience to find um, centeredness, let alone compassion, yes. in that kind of context. Um, how, do you, how do you think about compassion for the context of the day-to-day working, the rest of life, relation, relationships, family life, parenting, how do, how do we bring it in, and especially maybe starting for people who aren't coming from the presumption of a meditation practice, like what's one thing that someone watching um, this could take forward and start doing tomorrow without sitting on a cushion? Well, that's a actually a very important question because in the end, even if you happen to be one of the few people who do a lot of sitting on the cushion, <laughs> if that does not translate in your everyday action, how you treat others, how you treat your family, how you treat your colleagues at work, then that it doesn't matter how many hours you do on this cushion, it just it really has no effect, frankly. Right. And it becomes almost a self-indulgent, self-absorbed activity. I mean, there's a reason why sometimes people kind of you know, cynically call it navel gazing. You know? <laughs> There's a reason why. So uh, I would argue that the real theater in which compassion has a role is the real life. It's not when you're closing your eyes and sitting on a cushion. And here, that you know, His Holiness has a very, very beautiful imagery. You know, he was asked. You know, he's, someone asked him as journalist said, you know, as a monk, you've been monk for all these years, but Every morning you get up at 3.30 and you meditate for 3-4 hours. Why do you have to still meditate? Mm -hmm. And the Dalai Lama said, well, my, I see my morning sitting as a way of recharging my battery. And then the real place where I use my battery is in my day-to-day -day interaction with other people. And that, I think, is a powerful understanding of what something like sitting on a cushion is mm -hmm. supposed to do. Now for someone who has never done a sitting and who's not really interested in sitting because I don't think everybody is really inclined to do that, you know, I mean it's just people are, some people are more contemplative, some people are very action oriented. So what I would suggest, you know, that we can learn from the compassion kind of practice is that the importance of intention, you know, compassion is necessarily, you know, involves setting your intention, you know, so in, in 
plain English, when we talk about compassion, we generally think of, ah, oh, feeling sorry for this poor guy or poor kid. It's very much feeling oriented. But on the other hand, if you think carefully, one of the key components of compassion is an intention. You know, you want to help someone. You want to, you know, you, you want to allow someone into your heart. Make, even making a space is an act of intentionality. So I think being more mindful of the role of intention and bringing intention into your action. So, for example, you, you brought up the whole question of you know, dealing with technology on a daily basis, when you are very busy, but at the same time you have a family, how do you kind of, you know, kind of divide up? If you take the role of intention seriously, then you would have a way of prioritizing what is important in your life. Because if you don't pay enough attention to the intention in your life, then you go through life as if in a half sleepwalk, you know, it's just, you know, it becomes a routine, you know, the alarm goes off, you know, you get up, you make a cup of coffee, you know, the time to go to work, you drop your kids at school, you just go through the life as if in a motion, you know, as an as a everyday routine, whereas if you take intention seriously, you can make an intention in the morning. You know, this day, I will try to have my priorities better organized, I'm going to pay more attention to my spouse, be kinder to my colleagues at workplace, be more attentive, be more mindful of what I say. That intention, you know, and you don't have to sit down on a cushion to do that. You can do that while you are driving, you are commuting in a you know, subway or whatever it is. You set the intention and that changes the whole tenor of your day. You know, you may be, not be able to live up to the whole day, which is a tall order, mm -hmm. but the fact that you set an intention begins to organize your life. And that way, I think, even people who don't meditate at all can bring compassion as an important part of their life because they, have, they can choose to respond to a situation out of compassion, to give the other person the benefit of the doubt instead of reacting immediately from a kind of a you know, negative judgment point of view. You, you're, going to, you, you're going to look at the humanity of the other side first. So how do you, as a person who is very involved with multiple organizations, you are, you travel around to support and translate His Holiness, you're translating texts, <laughs> how do you in a day to day, as you're moving through your day, keep your eye on that intention and what are some of the, are there questions you ask yourself that help you sift through your priorities on any given day or week and, and how you're spending your time that we could learn from? Well, I don't know. I mean, I, I've been fortunate because, uh, you know, when I was uh, 11 years old, I chose to become a monk. So, so for more than 25 years, um, I, was, uh, I was a monk, you know, um, um, yeah, yeah, almost 25 years. So, and over, the, over those <coughs> 25 years, um, I was able to acquire a lot of, you know, mental discipline and skills that are part of it. So, um, I've been very fortunate. But one thing that I do realize and you know, recognize is that, um, you know, there's a certain, I mean, there's a finite amount of resources that you have, you know, in terms of time, in terms of attention. Um, and also, you know, there's no way one person can do everything. So this humility mm -hmm. that you cannot do solve all the world's problem, uh, I think is a very important and the second thing is also if you have some degree of self-awareness, you begin to see where you can be most effective and mm -hmm. helpful. Mm -hmm. So those kind of things are really helpful. And also, um, you know, one of the great insights coming from Buddhist psychology is that it's one thing to be motivated to do something, and even fear can motivate you, mm -hmm. or <laughs> anger can motivate you, or dislike of someone can motivate you. But if you need a sustained motivation, then joy has to be part of it. Mm. So, and we know that you know, parents who have tried to push their children to pick up a sport <laughs> will know that you know, the first few 
you know, kind of month. It's a real struggle. You they, sometimes they don't want to go. You drag them. You take them to <laughs> whatever it is. Then a day comes when they start enjoying it. After that, you don't have to push them. You know, they they enjoy. They enjoy doing it. So I think in your life, at least in my own case, I find a tremendous sense of fulfillment in the work that I do. So which really gives me the powerful motivation to continue to carry on doing it. Mm -hmm. So my work with the Tibetan texts, my service to His Holiness, you know, all of this gives me a tremendous sense of joy, mainly because I have a certain belief and value system that appreciates the importance of these things. So when I'm able to do this, a sense of fulfillment arises, which gives me the joy. And I think one of the things that I would actually, you know, suggest to people who, um, you know, who, who want to try this out, is to, in addition to having the right priorities in our life, you know, you have to make sh find some, make sure that whatever you are committed to doing, there is an element of joy in this. Mm -hmm. Then you don't, you know, because relying on exertion or will all the time is not a skillful strategy. You can push with your will up to a point. Mm -hmm. But beyond that, it gets exhausting. So you really need to have a joy. And I've been very fortunate because, you know, I have found something that I find really deeply meaningful. And that probably partly because I am an ethnic Tibetan, part of the Tibetan stateless refugee community, the situation of Tibet, Tibetan people back home, the survival of the culture is a major issue for us. So anything that I can do to help make this important culture and language survive is a great, you know, sense of, gives me a great sense of fulfillment and I found a purpose. So I think individuals need to find whatever it is mm -hmm. that makes them, you know, having a sense of purpose and finding a real joy in their pursuit. Mm -hmm. So even if their work isn't necessarily a calling that they're going to, they look for something that they can bring their whole self to exactly. bring their heart into, exactly. if exactly. it's yeah. the relationships exactly. that they're yeah. striving. Um, so what are some of those domains that you would recommend for people to think about if, if the cause of their day-to-day -day work life isn't bringing out that sense of passion? Where are some of the places they can direct their attention? Well, I mean, you know, in unless you are a translator or a writer like me, which is a very, very solitary pursuit, <laughs> most people work in a group context where there are other colleagues. And really finding a workplace where you can have a meaningful relationship with your colleagues, I think it's an important one. Mm -hmm. Because unfortunately, you know, when people choose a workplace, they generally tend to choose where they get paid most. Mm -hmm. And there was actually... I mean, there was an interesting survey done in Google, uh, you know, a couple of years ago, now quite a while ago, when Facebook was emerging and, you know, these other startups were emerging. So, you know, good engineers were being headhunted, you know. Mm -hmm. So many of these more established, you know, tech places like Google were worried about losing their best engineer. So they wanted to somehow motivate their top engineer to stay. And one of, they had a survey about what would make you stay, you know, would it be more, more pay, increasing your pay, or more food costs, or better childcare facilities, um, wellness activities, Surprise, well surprisingly, but not surprisingly, although it's surprising because Google engineers are already paid well, but so for me it came as a surprise, but on the other hand it's not really surprising. Top item was really more pay. So <laughs> people still believe they saw that. that more pay is the secret to happiness. But in reality, what is more important in a work context is finding a workplace where you feel valued, where you feel recognized, where you feel you have a group of people that you are friends. And finding that kind of... And so even though the work itself may not be something that is deeply passionate, something that, you know, for example, like, you know, saving the world or feeding the poor or, you know, bringing education that, you know, kind of teaching on math in the, you know, the depressed neighborhood kids and, 
you know, there are a lot of very, very powerful, meaningful works like that. The work may not be that. But if you are able to find a workplace where the relationships and also the culture of that workplace is a compassionate culture, where you are valued, where you are valued as a human being, then, you know, going to work could be a real joy. Mm -hmm. You know, so I think those are things that, you know, as people look for jobs, I think these are things that people probably need to look at. People need to look at, not just ask how much I'm going to get paid, which is important, right. but that shouldn't be the bottom line. Right. You know, if, you know, I for one, if I'm an engineer, which I'm not, so, <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're looking for a job. If there is one place where the work culture is more compassionate, more human, and there is a genuine sense of camaraderie among the you know, employees versus another place which is quite productive but highly competitive. Um, and if I'm paid 20% more there, I would choose the place where I'm paid 20% less, but I'm good, I know I'm going to be happier. Mm -hmm. I'm going to find greater sense of meaning. And people don't make that kind of calculation right now, and which is a mistake. Mm -hmm. because why would you want to take 20% more to be miserable? Right. <laughs> I mean, that, that just doesn't make any sense because the reason, the whole reason for making more money is to have happier life. <laughs> but why would you deliberately choose a place just because it's paying you more when you know perfectly well that you're going to be less happy there? So I think those things people will have to be smart. Mm -hmm. yeah. It's a very different kind of logic. Yeah, it's a different logic. <laughs> but it's yeah, but logical. on the other hand, it is a logical because uh -huh. the whole kind of rationale for looking for more money is to have mm -hmm. greater happiness, you know, so that you could support your family better without having to worry about your financial stability. All because you want to have a happier life, you know. And then we come home stressed out and, <laughs> exactly. and make our family unhappy and ourselves in, yeah, in the process. Yeah. Well, and it also. The other piece I'd love to explore is the side of what we bring in terms of our mindset. So thinking of, for example, Amy Rosnetsky the, um, at the Yale School of Management has done a lot of research about the purpose that people bring sure. to their workplace. Um, and you know the examples of someone interviewing janitors in hospitals, and one person can very much view it as um, a means to a paycheck and not the most preferred one sure. and another person doing the exact same role can view themselves as an integral part of the healing process upon who the whole pyramid will fall if they don't do their job well because it will be infectious exactly. that are spread. Exactly, yeah. So how, I'm curious how do we take that kind of, how do we proactively um, reframe how we're thinking about our day-to-day -day interactions, maybe borrowing on some of the um, tricks out of the, the Tibetan tradition for doing the mind training work? I think here, of course, the Tibetan tradition has a lot to say, but I think the, the, the insights coming out from the whole research on mindsets, mm -hmm. the, you know, the concept that uh, Carol Dweck um, you know, kind of coined, the key term, I think that I think is a very, very powerful uh, idea, and, and it's an old idea, actually. The, the name is new, the term is new. In the Buddhist psychology, we talk about the importance of outlook. Outlook. Uh, but it's the same thing, basically, the way you see yourself, the way you see your relationship with the situation, where you see the world around you. Um, and the, in other words, it's the attitude that you bring to, into the world that really has a huge difference. The example that you gave about a janitor, the janitor understands his function within the whole ecosystem of that workplace. You know, the fact that when the employees come during the daytime, most janitors tend to work at night, you know. And if, you know, if, if the employees come, you know, in the morning, when they see a clean place, you know, which, is, which feels fresh, you know, it changes because we are very sensitive to cues around us. We are emotional creatures, you know, he knows that it makes a difference. And also, you know, he can see this job as providing a, a livelihood that enables him to support his family. Mm -hmm. And maybe their kids' education, which then has a... So it's not simply 
a job to do, mm -hmm. but it's this job fits within the larger context of a whole ecosystem. And the more one is able to view that, um, you know, the more the person is going to get a greater sense of purpose out of it. Mm -hmm. And in any case, you know, we need to do some work anyway to make a living. Right. You might as well have a very healthy attitude to the work that you do because you're stuck doing it anyway. Right. So the choice is between doing it miserably or doing it with a sense of purpose and having some joy in it. And in the end, it's up to us. Right. Nothing in the environment is going to change it. It's really the attitude that we bring. And this is where the whole research coming out of, you know, mindset. Mm -hmm. You know, even with respect to people who have terminal illness like cancer, you know, it seems the mindset of the person really has a huge impact on the recovery or, you know, healing. So, it, it's, a, it's a powerful, powerful insight. Yeah. And this, what I'm hearing what you're saying as well is this taking fundamental agency for our own outlook. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. And I don't know that that's something that, that's a, that's a real reframe yes. from just looking at our day as something that's happening to us versus exactly. constructing yeah. our outlook exactly. about how we're approaching yeah. exactly. our day. And also to a large extent, you know, what happens to us in a day-to-day -day life, you know, on a daily basis, uh, many of which we don't really have much control because we are social creatures. Mm -hmm. So unless we choose to be like the monastics who live in the mountains, hermits, meditating and alone, um, the fact that we are part of a society means even to do a grocery, we have to friends. So, you know, so we have certain responsibility and control over how we interact, how we say, you know, how what we say. But what is coming out from the other side, we don't really have, mm -hmm. <laughs> because there's another agent on the other side. So um, being able to make a conscious decision and choice on how to, you know, see the world, you know, I mean, whether, it's a simple example. Depending on, for example, right now in this country, there's a lot of debate on the immigration issue. Depending on whether you see the new immigrants as a welcome, you know, group who's going to enrich the American society, who's going to bring skills, you know, and at the same time who's going to bring a wide range of experience that Native American, you know, people here don't have it, versus someone who sees these as source of threat, they are alien, they don't share our cultures, they don't share our values, we don't quite know what they're going to bring. It's the same situation, depending upon the attitude that you have, it's going to completely change your feelings. You know, if you view them as sources of danger, threat, you know, like, then of course you're going to have a negative attitude, and you're going to have a negative feeling that goes with it. If you view them as enriching the society, bringing a whole range of new experience and story that goes with it, your attitude is going to, be, going to be different, and also your feeling towards these newcomers are going to be different. So we know it's exactly the same fact, <laughs> okay? It's exactly the same fact, but depending on where these two people are coming from, it's a completely different feeling. That's such a great example. Should we take a couple of the questions sure. from the yeah. Facebook? Okay. Um, start with one here from Joshua Steinfeld who writes that he's interested in both of our takes on how to navigate times where there's nothing one can do to physically help someone or improve a situation. Um, what role does compassion play in these times and what might compassion practice look like when a sense of overwhelm or helplessness is present? That's a great question. Okay, that's a very good question actually. There, um I think one of the beautiful things about compassion is that um, you know, taking compassion seriously also means that sometimes you have to admit that there is no solution mm. to a problem. Um, and it, what is required, what it demands as a compassionate response is a degree of humility. Um, and it's a very tough thing for us to do, especially for men. You know, men like to solve problems. I mean, there was this you know, hugely popular book called Men Are From Mars and Women Are From Venus. <laughs> and, uh, you know, of course, the book was hugely exaggerated, but some of the basic points were pretty insightful. The fact that men 
are very, very poor and in a kind of just being with a problem, mm. you know, and with being with a problem with the patients and wanting to immediately solve the situation. So I think what compassion, the wisdom of compassion demands is that sometimes you just have to accept that this is how it is going to be. And the most compassionate thing to do in that situation is to really convey to this other person who is suffering that you are there. You are there for him or for her. And should the need arises to talk or whatever needs to be done. But not try to be frustrated and angry because you can't solve the problem. So I think that I think is an important mm -hmm. um, lesson. And also one of the things about compassion is that if you are able to recognize that there sometimes there are no solutions and, and your failure to solve that problem does not reflect, suggest somehow you haven't got something right. It's really the nature of things. And that acceptance of the certain limitations on I think it's going to be quite helpful. Um, and it's not a form of defeatism, you know, because it, it, it becomes a form of defeatism because if you expect everything to be solvable and if you bring impatience as and part of your kind of strategy, then when you are not able to solve the problem, you give up. Mm -hmm. I mean, this is why, um, you know, a truly compassionate person has a real staying power mm -hmm. because the person person's motivation to help someone is not contingent upon the actual problem being solved. You know, you are motivated because you want to help. You know, whether that help actually is successful or not depends on many factors. But your job as a compassionate person is to do all your best. So I think those kind of things are a tough thing to do, uh, but as you become more and more experienced in your kind of bringing genuine compassion into a situation, you begin to learn about these things. I mean, mm -hmm. look at someone like His Holiness Dalai Lama. He has been leading the Tibetan struggle for, you know, almost 60 years, you know, and he still hasn't given up. <laughs> so, you know, and, and he's generally moved by compassion towards the situation of the Tibetan people and its survival, and as well as compassion for the China as a nation and Chinese people. Mm -hmm. So, and, and this truly compassionate motivation gives him the ability to stay on course. And he has often pointed out that if your motivation is genuinely compassionate and you get involved in a particular cause, then your commitment and dedication to that cause should not be contingent upon your work being successful. That, I think, is a very, very difficult thing to mm -hmm. take, particularly to a, to a modern mind, you know, where we are so used to switching on a, you know, a light and automatically seeing light. You know, we, we're so used to automat, you know, automatic kind of responses. But on the other hand, he's making a very, very powerful point. You know, if you are committed to a cause, your commitment and dedication should not be contingent upon this problem being solved within X number of years, no? <laughs> um, so maybe as a closing question for you, I'm curious what in your wildest dreams, if the culture was to take up compassion, um, how would we go about doing that? What impact would it have? How could it, how could it play out as if this became a priority in our values and our education? In our workplaces. Well, that's a really uh, <laughs> very ambitious uh, question. Um, <laughs> I snuck that one. Yeah, in. <laughs> I know. I know. Um, but I think the first beneficiary of taking compassion seriously is the individual himself or herself. Mm. And it sounds a strange thing to say because, and it's also almost paradoxical. Because compassion is supposed to be about other people, not about you. But the real story is that the moment you choose to take compassion seriously and make compassion as an important part of the equation 
in guiding your life, then it changes the way you treat other people, people who are immediate in your life, your spouse, your children, your colleagues. You know, you choose to give people the benefit of the doubt. You choose you choose not to react from a position place of you know habitual defensiveness and negative judgment. You choose to have a more expansive space in your heart so that you see your own well-being in the context of relationship with others completely changes. And if you look at truly compassionate individuals, you know, and I have of course had the privilege of serving His Holiness for over 30 years now, there's a genuine sense of ease. There's a kind of a settledness. There's a kind of a, almost a sense of freedom because they have chosen to open their heart and really choose to trust humanity and they function in the world from that place not naively of course but they have chosen their first response is really going to come from that place of understanding and compassion and that gives them a sense of confidence and courage and sense of freedom and ease and pe these people are so comfortable in their skin and wouldn't everybody want that? <laughs> I mean, like, I would love, I mean, I, I can claim I have an element of that. Mm. And that, I mean, it's, wouldn't everybody want that? And once individuals are able to change, the repercussions, the impact of that, the kind of the ripple effects of that is going to be, you know, amazing. And this is why someone like His Holiness is so keen to get this kind of wisdom and practice into the school arena. Mm. Because if children learn this kind of habit early on, imagine the 70, 80 years they will have in front of their life. The multiple effects, the ripple effects of someone who has grown up having this kind of outlook. And this, I think, is the way to change the world. And of course, you need to have both top-down and bottom-up approach. Working from the children and the school is from the bottom-up approach. But the top-down approach is where we need to bring the conversation about the place of compassion, role of compassion, at the policy level, mm -hmm. you know, at the international level. Uh, and, in, and one could argue that, in a way, this has already happened, although we haven't taken it seriously. Because if you look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, UN Charter, the UN Charter, I would argue, is one of the most moral, compassionate international documents that have been ever produced. Mm. The aspiration behind that is a genuinely compassionate you know, outlook that choose to recognize the oneness of every single human being. By virtue of being a human being, there's a set of rights that the individual must enjoy. You know, to be taken, treated within a given society. That common humanity is the heart of compassion. And one could argue that at the, even at the international top-down level, if people are willing, they can do it. Mm. You know, the UN Charter of Human Rights had a huge impact in setting a standard by which we judge the quality of the government. It is there, you know, some people may give, some countries may give lift service, but they also understand it's the standard by which they are judged. You know, even repressive regimes like China, they always complain when there's a human rights violation, you know, kind of report criticizing them. They care. So I think there are, there are ways in which a top-down approach can, can work. And this is where there needs to be a policy-level conversation about the place of compassion because we have built a system where we have taken the self-pursuit element of human nature very seriously and built up a whole system based on economy and social structure based on this but we haven't taken the nurturing compassionate part of human being seriously mm. and that side of the story needs to be told and then also you know social scientists need to work hard to spell out Economists need to work out to spell out what would that mean? What structural changes we need to make at the level of society and the government and policies to really rep represent the both sides of the human nature. So I'm actually quite 
optimistic. You know, as people say, oh, it can never be taken up seriously. But I always point out the example of UN and UN Charter on Human Rights and Declaration of Human Rights. Mm -hmm. Well, thank you so much. Thanks. I think we all needed some of that uplift. <laughs> thank you. Really appreciate your well, time you. in, yeah. in talking tonight. And thank you, everyone, for thank being you. here with us. And thank you for joining us, and thank you for the interest. Thank you very much. Thank Thanks you. so much.